A data lake is a central repository that stores vast amounts of raw, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data in its native format. Unlike traditional databases, which enforce specific data structures and formats, a data lake allows data to be stored without predefining its structure. This could be text, images, audio, video, logs, as well as structured data from databases and spreadsheets. This flexibility makes it a powerful platform for handling diverse and large scale data sets. The biggest downside of a data lake is that they're hard to govern and organize all of the data getting tossed into it. Most of us have seen large file stores shared across work or school and how much of a mess they become. Uh, this is often jokingly referred to as becoming a data swamp. To combat this, most data lakes are broken up into zones. The raw zone is where data enters in its unprocessed form. The goal is to capture data quickly, preserving it in its original state so it can be used later for various purposes, such as auditing, compliance, or reprocessing. The inevitable mess of this shared file storage should be contained to just this zone. The staging zone is where data is prepared for processing. We'll be refining our data by removing duplicates, standardizing data types, validating its quality, and most importantly, acting as a gate to prevent the junk from getting out of the raw zone. The curated zone is where data sits, ready and available to be used for analysis, reporting, and other applications. The data here has been transformed, aggregated, and integrated with other data sets. The data has been modeled, meaning it's been organized and structured in a way to be optimized for the specific processes that are going to be using it. Often this can actually be a data warehouse separate from the data lake, because at this point the data is generally structured and modeled in a way where data warehouses perform better than data lakes. And this is also where the lake house architectures come in. These three zones are often referred to as bronze, silver, and gold layers of the medallion architecture. Additionally, you might want to set up a zone as a sandbox for development or discovery, and a zone for cold storage. While you can just take a bunch of files and drop them into a file share, either on-premise or in the cloud like AWS S3 or Azure Blob, that won't really get you past the raw zone for effectiveness. In order for a database to guarantee reliable and consistent data transactions, they need to be ACID compliant. This is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. We won't dive too much into this, but they all come down to repeating the same transaction will give you the same results. And one transaction won't impact another transaction. And data changes made just won't disappear. By default, data lakes are not ACID compliant because they're optimized for large volumes of diverse raw data. This is great for hoarding data in a raw layer, but unreliable for holding modeled accurate curated data. So this is where table formats come in. They're essentially a layer that sits on top of a data lake using a variety of metadata files and pointers to enforce ACID compliance. Some examples are Iceberg, Hootie, and Delta. So for building a picture of this, our data is sitting in a data lake like S3 or Azure Blob. They are stored with a table format, which adds a layer to make them ACID compliant. Now, what files are these data stored in? Since anything can be thrown into a data lake, we could have CSV, XLS, JPEG, JSON, anything we want. But for our table formats to work, we really want things to be in a data-friendly file format. The most popular file format is Parquet, but there's also ORC, Avro, and many others. Most of these aren't human readable. So for example, if you have a CSV, you can open the file and read it. But if you convert that CSV to Parquet, it will process faster. But if you open it, you'll just see machine garbage. These file types have various pros and cons, so it's good to research and test for your specific need. But the key here is knowing that when someone says Parquet, it's not where the file is stored, it's not a database, it's not a language, it's just a file type designed for quick data operations. So we have how our file is structured, where it is stored, and how we ensure ACID compliant transactions. What actually does these transactions? For that, we need a data framework and processing engine. The most popular of these is Spark, which has pushed aside MapReduce and Hive, but there are also some others like Flink and Presto. Frameworks facilitate the development process and provide structured environments to work with data efficiently. They'll have libraries, APIs, tools specific for data extraction, transformation, loading, analysis, and visualization, 
Once code is written using the framework, these processing engines will divide the data and computation across multiple machines in a cluster. So if you write the same code using Python and PySpark, they might look very similar and the results will be the same, but PySpark will run much, much faster because it will utilize much more compute than standard Python can. I've experienced several jobs where someone thought they could just drop files into a file share and proclaim they made a data lake. But as you can see, if you want something a bit more production ready, it's a bit more complicated than that. 